Greetings and welcome to another edition of The Pedal Shift Project. The Pedal Shift Project is a series of conversation, thoughts, and experiments around the bike touring lifestyle. From tips and tricks to ideas on how to ride your ride, let's shrink the world by bike. Show notes and more are available at pedalshift.net slash 231, and you can email the show at pedalshift at pedalshift.net or text me at 202-930-1109 and check Pedal Shift out also on all the socials as well. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 231st edition of the Pedal Shift Project. My name is Tim Mooney. Thanks so much for joining. On this edition, we're, well, we're in the middle of winter, so I don't have a lot to talk about from a touring perspective, um, especially given everything that's going on. But, um, you know, it's, it's a good time to start thinking about the future of bicycle touring and, and the next season that's coming up. And, and one thing that's been, I think, a consistent theme of my touring is evolution. And no place is that a bigger deal than the evolution from kind of traditional four pannier, fully loaded touring more towards something that looks and feels like bikepacking, if not doing bikepacking all along. And I, I think that I've laid down the groundwork over 230 some odd episodes that, you know, I don't think that there's a right or a wrong way to do it. And, and I know that some people really, really focus on the ultralight vibes, the backcountry vibes of the more modern look of the bikepacking setups, you know, the saddlebags, the frame bags, things like that. Thinner, slimmer, downgraded, I guess, and, and not not to use that as a, a, a pejorative, but like, you know, much less, the less is more kind of vibe. And of course, there's a difference in the bikes and there's a difference in the types of t- type of touring that's going in there. And I have to say that I... I, I'm, I'm, I'm intrigued with it all. Not that I think that uh, pannier-based touring is bad or is going by the wayside. In fact, I'm pretty sure I'm probably going to be doing that um, for the rest of the time I ever do touring. But I think that I'm starting to become more and more enamored with the upsides for doing more of a bike packing setup and what that can open up for me as I go forward. So I think that when it all comes down to it, uh, whether you label yourself as a bike tourist or as a bike packer, or you, you reject the labels, it, it, it ultimately doesn't matter because from my perspective, I want to make sure that I'm going to be handling the gear and getting the right gear that suits the tour that I'm about to go on best. And sometimes as I have discovered, it means paring things down. It means moving more into frame bags. It means uh, maybe doing some tours without bringing along the two big Ortley back rollers along with me. Um, and I think that that is something that I found some success with over time. And I've talked about this on the show that I have experimented at least a little bit, largely with gear that I already have. I don't have anything that is technically bike packing gear bags or or whatnot. And as I'll talk about in a few minutes here, as I've been digging into this a little bit more, part of that is a function of the bicycles that I have. Um, but ultimately, what I want to do is to start uh, bringing you in on the thought process that I've been having lately about what it would mean to explore bike packing as a part of my touring profile in 2021. The biggest thing that I'm interested in is slimming down the profile of whatever I'm riding. And what that basically means is that anything that hangs off laterally off of the bike, anything that will catch wind, (laughs) basically, that's a bit of a wind drag, either headwinds or you know, the profile that as you, as you cut through the air to slim that down. I think that that is the number one benefit that I see to bike packing. In addition to the functionality of it is that you're dropping weight so that you can go harder, longer, faster. You can climb easier things along those lines. So that, that's kind of the thing that I'm most attracted to. I, I think that ultimately when you are getting out of the big side panniers and you are looking more at a, uh, a frame bag and saddlebags and some other things, again, I'm going to be talking about kind of my thought process in a little bit here. It looks to me that it would, as a consequence, mean 
slim down the gear, bring only what you need. The the extra clothing goes by the wayside, the the luxury items or the luxury versions of the items that I sometimes bring stove comes to mind, you know, that goes by the wayside. So it's, it's putting a premium on space and weight and either doing a very low or stripped down type of camping trip or a no camping touring thing. So I think that the interesting thing about the bike packing scenario is that it serves two different, very diametrically opposed tours that I'm thinking of off of the top of my head. The first is, you know, this lets you get into the backcountry kind of a thing. This is trails. This is single track. This is gravel. Kind of the stuff that most people do when they do backpack, bike packing. But also, I think that it serves the other diametrically opposed type of, of touring, and that is kind of credit card touring. You know, are you going to be going uh, into places where you're not going to be focused on doing camping? You're going to be staying, as I've been saying in recent episodes, roofed lodging, you know, hotels, Airbnbs, things along those lines. Because I think a bike packing setup really serves that very well, because frankly, you don't need to bring as much stuff. Um, I have typically for those trips used the Brompton um, and slim things way down. I think that what I'm thinking about is not the Brompton su- using the Safari, and that's going to be one of the things I'm going to be talking about in a moment here, thinking about using my existing stuff and then maybe kind of expanding from there. Okay, so this is yet another in the series of I'm bringing you along for my thought process that I usually do don't kind of force you to go along in because it it ends up being actually kind of an interesting episode. Um, One other thing that is part of the thought process here before I get into the options that I've been exploring is that there are a ton of trails and there's actually some good, decent gravel here in West Virginia where I'm recording from. And as I'm starting to kind of see that I'm going to be here primarily for the next several months, at least before reverting back to DC once, you know, vaccines happen and the office says, hey, come on back. We'd like you to not work remotely anymore. You know, I think I'd like to focus uh, because I have got time out here to do some more of the stuff that's out this direction as well. So I've been doing some exploring on all of that. There's actually just as a sidebar to all of that, Uh, some very interesting hiking trails nearby that um, the access points to them are old uh, logging and I I guess uh, mining roads here very, very close to my cabin. In fact, I can access by foot from here. So I'm kind of intrigued about the possibility that if I do walk this path of bike packing and a particular option that I'm going to be talking about in a moment, you know, will I be able to utilize those resources that have been here all along? And I didn't even realize it until I started looking at some kind of winter cross training of doing some kind of a back or a bike, excuse me, some backpacking here in West Virginia. So more to come on that because I'm kind of excited about that. And I just sort of discovered that mostly over the last couple of days. So um, that's going to be developing too. So I wanted to go through essentially the three different options that I've been noodling about in my head about exploring bikepacking in 2021 for me as a kind of traditional bike tourist that's been dabbling in this. So the first thing probably is just a continuation of what I've been doing, and that is option one, modifying what I already have from a bike perspective and seeing what is in the realm of possible from a bikepacking perspective. And, and modifying what I have is not changing anything on the bike. And that's kind of the key issue here. Of course, I could change the bike and do things to make that more of a bikepacking type of a bike, but I wanted to see what was in the realm of possible. So the first thing that I was looking at was fork cages. And for those of you who haven't used those, they are kind of the new thing that has been going coming around where essentially you think of it as a gigantic water bottle cage, for lack of a better way of putting it, where you can kind of get eh, maybe up to 10 liter size dry bags that get strapped in there. And so it, it sort of is the replacement for a front pannier situation, but because it's a little more... Um, centered in on the uh, fork itself, it tends to have some advantages to it. And it certainly is true in the bikepacking context. And I was very, very excited. Actually, I was all set to buy a set of these uh, for my my uh, bike just because I wanted to try them and maybe, you know, it would give me more options for whatever type of touring. And then I re- looked at my bike and I realized, hey, remember when I had to have the fork replaced earlier this year? 
Well, one of the things that they did is they said, oh, and by the way, um, it doesn't have the brazons on it. And um, I wish I had known that I would have waited extra long to um, have those in there. Those are the things that kind of uh, these types of things actually kind of screw into. And it actually changes the it modifies the uh, water bottle capacity that I have actually on the bike. If you remember from way back, if you've been following the show, you will have noticed that I had uh, essentially water bottles on those fork brazons. And that worked out really well for me for a while. And when it came back from the shop and, and the guy, uh, the mechanic was like, hey, I, we got you a fork, but it didn't have this. I was like, eh, well, bummer, but no big deal. It's, it was kind of extra. And now that I was thinking about doing a fork cage on it, well, I can't do that anymore. At least I can't do it the way that it's sort of most efficient. There are ways that you can kind of get uh, them strapped on there, but uh, I would much feel much better about it if they were actually screwed in uh, like a good bike packing bike has. I don't have that anymore. So that would be about 20 liters worth of capacity that I could have had um, that I no longer have, from my perspective, the right option for. So going to dispense of that. Unfortunately, that would have been something that I could have used by modifying my existing bike. Too bad. Can't do it. Okay. Next thing what you typically see on a bike packing setup is a handlebar roll. And they tend to work really, really well to carry quite a bit of stuff. It can be a tent, it can be a sleeping kit, it can be all sorts of things. Often they um, have quick releases to them. There's all sorts of different uh, companies that make them. There, You can get them on the cheap side, you can get them on the expensive side. They're fascinating, and I've really been interested in that. Back in the day, I used to have a... Um, a handlebar bag that I used to use a lot and I've dispensed of that. So I thought, you know what, maybe I've got the opportunity to do a handlebar roll. Well, as it turns out, unfortunately, my current design, the brake cables are just very much in the way. And it reminds me of one of the reasons why I went away from the handlebar bag is because it would often push on those brake cables. And so that's when I went to the front platform design that I currently have, because that puts things out past those brake cables. And that's where I strap down uh, currently a dry bag that contains my sleeping kit. So the handlebar roll won't work at all. And it also is difficult to do something like that on the style of handlebars that I have. If you've seen my uh, Novara Safari, it is the kind of mustache style handlebar. And the way that I've got it angled, it would not be a little bit difficult. It would interfere not with just the brake cables, but with the braking itself. And so as a result, that's another thing that I'm going to have to say is, yeah, it doesn't really work with the bike as I have configured. Now, I've, I've, as I mentioned, I could change the bike. I could change the cabling. I could change how they run and make it so that I had room there. I could swap out the handlebar, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm, I'm focused at least in this first option of what can I do to make this bike be more bike packy? And the answer is four cages, no handlebar roll. No, as it turns out, um, Two other things that I looked at. Once it went, you may be noticing that once you kind of reject the stuff on the front, it really sort of makes the whole thing fall apart when all is said and done. But let me tell you something that I've done in the past that actually, you know, is obviously doable because I've done it in the past is putting just instead of having rear panniers, having a dry bag on the rear rack. Um, or considering doing a saddle bag. So the dry bag on the rear rack is kind of how I got all started with all of this. Before I even had panniers, I would essentially just put a dry bag on the back of the rack and that was it. And that's how I started. Um, that's kind of good and efficient. And if you've seen pictures of the uh, any of my recent tours, I have a long orange because of course, dry bag that I typically keep either my tent or some other things and depends on the, the nature of what I'm carrying. Typically in recent uh, tours, it's been my tent. You know, I can, instead of putting that horizontal across the rear rack with the two panniers there, because the panniers kind of hold it up a little bit, you could rotate it 90 degrees so that it is going actually along the uh, line, the center line of the bike. In fact, if you followed my tour of DC to Cincinnati, <laughs> I, I took some heat for this. I had it actually on the front rack and yes, it was long and yes, it made it kind of a weird look when uh, I wasn't riding, but it actually worked pretty well in there. And again, kind of cut through the headwinds and things like that because it was again in the line of my body riding and the bike itself. 
So that would be a possibility going forward. And, and I've certainly used it um, and, and, and actually kind of adopted that for the most part. But that's not atypical for, for pannier touring anyways, to have an additional rack bag on top of there. It's kind of the same idea. Um, I looked into saddlebags, but, you know, if you start with the prospect of saying, okay, I'm going to not bring the panniers. I'm going to throw things into dry bags that'll be in line on the two platforms. A saddlebag ends up being sort of belt and suspenders at that point. Um, it, it looks like that having a true dry bag would interfere a little bit with the saddlebag. And, and frankly, I, I would, of all of the possibilities that are out there for bike packing, the bag style that resonates with me the least is the saddlebag. I think that when you have a rear rack, it doesn't make a lot of sense to have a saddlebag. I, I don't know if uh, there's folks listening who do both. I suppose it's possible, but it just strikes me that if you're going to put something on the back of the bike, it's probably going to end up going on the rear rack no matter what. So I, I'm, I'm sort of setting that aside for the moment in this option, this modify what I have right now. And ultimately, when you take a look at the modify the safari, you end up with as I said, the front, eh, nothing really works all that well compared to what I already have. And then on the back, it's sort of like, okay, well, I guess I just do a couple of dry bags on the front platform, the rear platform, and I've done that already. So I think that to transition from that to something a little bit more aggressively bike packy on this current bike, the physics don't work really well. How things are laid out doesn't really work really well with what I've got. I would have to change the bike itself. So that's certainly an option. I could look into doing that. Um, but having just thrown a bunch of money into the bike, eh, kind of not that interested in that. So modifying with what, what I have essentially just says, okay, reduce the amount of gear that you've got, get into dry bags, keep it in the center line. So I don't have things, uh, on the side. I've been doing that. I've experimented with that. It works pretty well, but it's not a real satisfactory bike packing setup by any stretch of the imagination, but still doable. Okay. Option two, what can I do? And this, this is frankly, uh, the, the, the realization of option one, trying to add different bags. This is option two, what I've just described, reducing the gear that I've got, get it into two to three dry bags and have that be in the center line. And that's basically what I stumbled into is the second option. Um, and as I mentioned, I've done it before. It's particularly easy for the no camping trips that I've been sort of thinking about, but it's also very good for overnights or for the type of camping where I don't have to worry about bringing more clothing or um, alternative things like uh, rain gear or stuff like that. If I know that it's going to be dry out, you know, I've gone with not bringing rain gear with me. And so this option is uh, something that I think works really well, but is it bike packing? Uh, I mean, kind of, we get into labels and, and, and yes, I mean, I suppose it is more, it's that modified bike packing setup that I've been talking about. It's worked well for me. What can I do to improve that is really where I'm at on the second option here. And that is thinking about the two different things, either going into a much more minimalist camping setup or using it for a no camping trip. So the minim more minimalist setup would be, all right, what is the bulkiest thing that I bring? It tends to be the tent. So what could I do? I have started to look into rediscovering hammock camping. Um, and I, I think that at the end of last year, and then, or as part of the discovery this season, is I love bringing the hammock with me. I don't like sleeping in it very much. Um, it, I tend not to be able to sleep in it very well. I know that there are tons of people who sleep way better in hammocks than they do in tents. I am not one of those people. Um, in fact, I have said on many occasions, I tried out doing the Hennessy hammock um, and ended up not using it enough and ended up selling it. So I think that hammocks, hammock camping, great for some people, not for me, Given have given it a try, may consider trying it again. The other thing that I've been looking at is looking at reducing the size of my current tent. Um, I will have to replace this tent probably this coming season. The Rainfly is, uh, as I mentioned, um, shot pretty much. The zippers are, it's it's over. <laughs> it's been a good run. It's been, let's see, uh, I did seven full seasons in it and um, it, 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 it is over. It is time to get a new one. And I've looked at it 
effectively just replacing it. Um, I really enjoyed it. It's a two-person tent. It's the uh, For those of you who are new to the show, it's an Alps Zephyr 2. They still sell them. They are incredibly well-priced. Uh, easily, They've now made them in a less um, orangey color, which bothers me, but also <laughs> because I do more stealth camping, might be a good idea to get away from the orange color. So um, I've looked at that. And then I've thought, you know what? What if I don't need all of that space all the time? I like it. It's a luxury. What if I ended up getting the one-person version of that? Well, it turns out it's not as small as you would think. It doesn't shave off a ton of extra weight. So all I get is less tent size. Um, Also looking at bivvies, but um, for me, I am a bit of a claustrophobe and don't really like having the tent be essentially right above my head. So, you know, maybe looking at no tent options um, certainly is an option out there. Just basically bringing a tarp and kind of functioning, uh, utilizing what's around you to make that work. Or, you know, there's lots of people who don't do tents at all and they just sort of cowboy camp um, and figure out ways to make that all work. These are all things that I'm throwing into the kitty here in this second option, which is essentially radically trying to reduce the amount of gear that I have. I think that works, like I said, for the no camping trips super easily. It works for short camping trips, but not for the long tours that I'm sort of looking forward to possibly doing sometime this year. So option two, while I think that there's ways to make it work, it's not, it's not great. So where does that bring me? Well, option three, and that is N plus one for those of you who follow bikey stuff. And that is, do I get a new bike? And I have to say, this is probably where I'm heading in this headspace of exploring bike packing for this year. Um, the Surly ECR looks amazing. I happen to have a friend, you know him uh, by name at least, and by voice, uh, Mysterious James, has a Surly ECR and has had great times with it. And um, he did it, he pimped it out. He did the 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 internal hub he did he did all sorts of you know built this thing up to be a beast and i think that that's something that looks really great it solves all of the issues that i have with the existing bike it basically says that i can get this bike and purchase the bike packing bags the frame bags the saddle bag perhaps even the the fork cages all of the things that make this into a classic bike packing bike Now, one thing that I've certainly discovered, as you have probably, is that COVID continues to limit availability of bikes across the board. And in my preliminary research on this, a a couple of things have come out. Um, Number one, Surly has slimmed down its bikepacking line. Um, You you may have heard this. I know they mentioned this on a recent edition of Sprocket. They've discontinued the non-disc long-haul trucker, which not technically a bike packing bike. I want to mention it because I know that impacts so many of you out there. They do still have the disc trucker, but that's a big deal in the bike touring world. That is the kind of classic uh, touring bike. But the Ogre, the Surly Ogre was one that I was really looking at for a long period of time. And it turns out they're not making them anymore. So um, given the run on bikes in the COVID era, I, I think that they're mostly gone. I think that they only have them in kind of the extreme sizes, the, the, the smalls or extra smalls or the extra larges. And it just doesn't fit my very average medium kind of frame needs. So the Ogre's not happening and they're keeping the ECR. And I think that's kind of the one that if I was going to get one, that's the one I'm focused on. So then the next question comes, you know, you've got the, the bike purchase, if I can get one. And it seems like some of the shops are starting to get some in, but it's unclear what the availability is going to be like this year. So that's another cool big question mark. Then the other thing is, okay, let's assume that I can get the uh, frame that I need in the style that I want. How do I go about this? Do I go the Mysterious James route? Do I do I pimp this thing out? Do I go all out or do I do this a little bit frugally with a, a, the sense that I can add more later? I think that given my current circumstance, I would say it might be more the former because I'm in a more of a position to be able to purchase a bike that is everything that I want. And I haven't bought a new bike in a few years. I've had the Brompton for several years now. And, uh, you know, I, 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 
it may be time. And I've certainly identified case uses for bike packing, and I certainly would use it. It really depends. But I mean, I don't probably have to tell anybody listening the go all out option can get really expensive really, really quickly. Um, so I, something to think about as I go along here, uh, whether or not that is the way that I want to go. But also, you know, you know, it's not just the bike. If I, if I go this route, I'm not just investing in the bike. I'm also going to be investing in bike packing bags, which can get pretty expensive as well. In the grand scheme of things, much less compared to the cost of the bike itself. Um, and I think that this would be certainly the area where I would invest in good quality uh, bike packing bags. If there's one thing that I've learned over the years, and I've certainly relayed that here on the show, you know, when I bought my uh, Ortley back rollers, that was an investment in touring. And it ended up paying dividends because I've used them for years and years and years, and they have stood up really well. Have I had to patch them? Yes. But if I had skimped and gotten, you know, a no-name brand or something that wasn't as built quite as well, I probably would have bought two or three sets of them by now. So I do think that uh, if I do go this route, I will get kind of maybe, maybe not name brand, but high quality like packing bags. Uh, I know there's been some folks that uh, actually per, uh, make them themselves, which I think is kind of interesting too. I am not nearly that handy. I will probably be whipping out the credit card for for that. So expense, very much a thing there. So where do I land? Again, option one, stick with my existing bike and try to slap bike packing bags and things on them. Doesn't work because of the nature of my current bike. Option two, stick with the current bike. Don't add anything new, just really radically reduce my gear down so that I can fit into a minimum number of dry bags so that they sit in line with how I ride. That's option two. I've kind of done that before, but I would need to get more aggressive about that to make it more of a bike packy setup. Um, One thing to add in there is I would probably modify the tires that I would have on that, go with a wider tire. Done that before, didn't really mention that. I actually have them. I've got the uh, uh, Schwabi Marathon Supremes, which aren't really good for bikepacking. In retrospect, they're just wider. So <laughs> I'll have to do some more work on that. Option three, new bike. Looking at the Surly ECR, looks pretty good, but obviously that's expensive. So where do I land? Look, um, you know, I've been threatening to buy a bike, new bike for a while, but it's it's a big outlay. And I just don't know if that's necessarily in the right place where I'm at right now, even though I feel like I could potentially afford it. But then the question, can I find it? I would need to justify the purchase of something like this by actually using it, or I will feel incredibly dumb slash wasteful slash whatever adjective you want to throw in there. The biggest thing I think working against that third option, which let's be honest, is the most fun, (laughs) is that there's a substantial overlap between my safari, the current touring bike, and what I would ride the ECR in or whatever bike packing bike I would get. When I would, when I, in this hypothetical world where I make this purchase, when I ride one and could use the other, I'll be thinking of that as waste um, because I'll have spent all of this money on a brand new bike. And if I'm in a place where I can actually ride it, uh, ride the, the safari, I'd be like, oh, well, why am I riding this bike? And if I ride the safari, I'll be like, well, I've got this brand new expensive bike at home. Why am I doing that? The spring tour that I'm looking at is almost certainly going to be on the safari. It's just a question of where, um, you know, it's probably going to be close to home again here where I'm sitting right now near in West Virginia, because it seems prudent to wait on vaccinations in the summer for a longer ride. So ultimately, you know, this long, (laughs) nearly half hour (laughs) exercise that I have now dragged you kicking and screaming into is I think I'm going to have to wait, but I am going to keep my eye on things and and make some decisions probably within the next few months about what I'm going to do, because it also is a function of what do I see the rest of the year looking like? And of course, if I buy a Surly ECR or some other new bike, I'm certainly going to be using it beyond 2021. Um, So it's just a question of what do I want to be doing for touring? Does having this third option resonate? Is this going to be something that I would use? And I think that the answer is, well, it depends. But I'm really excited that I'm kind of broadening 
my perspectives on this. I'm letting the evolution of how I've been approaching touring and the places that I want to go um, be a part of the thought process here. So curious what you all have uh, to say about this. And uh, if you have gone through a similar bit of uh, process as well with this, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Oh, by the way, let me just mess all of this up as well, because I've also thought about what about e-bike? <laughs> Because on a past episode, I talked about e-bikes and exploring that as a possibility. And uh, uh, one of the listeners, Brian, who has been a, a friend of the show for a long time, commented on the YouTube side of things and talked about the really amazing uh, e-bike that he has built for his type of touring, which is utterly and totally different from the bike packing kind of setup. So needless to say, I've been thinking about a new bike for a while. Again, more to think about. And as always, we like to close out the show with a special shout out to the Pedal Shift Society. Because of support from listeners like you, Pedal Shift is a weekly bicycle touring podcast with a global community, expanding into live shows and covering new tours. If you like what you hear, you can support the show for five bucks, two bucks, or even a buck a month. And there's one shot and annual options. If you're not into the small monthly thing, check it all out at pedalshift.net slash society. On to the society. Kimberly Wilson, Caleb Jenkinson, Cameron Lean, Andrew McGregor, Michael Hart, Keith Nagel, Brock Didis, Thomas Skadow, Marco Lowe, Terrence Manson, Harry Telgadis, Chris Barron, Mark Van Ram, Brad Hipwell, Mr. T, Nathan Poulton, Stephen Dickerson, Vince LaGreco, Cody Florchinger, Tom Beninati, Greg Braithwaite, Sandy Pizio, Jeff Muster, Seth Pollock, Joseph Quinn, Byron Patterson, Joachim Robber, Ray Jackson, Jeff Fry, Kenny Mikey, Lisa Hart, John Denkler, Steve Henkel, Miguel Quinones, Alejandro Avilas Reyes, Keith Spangler, Greg Towner, Dan Gebhardt, Jody Zoranin, Lucas Barwick, Michael Baker, Brian Bechtal, Reinhardt Biggle, Greg Middlemas, Connie Moore, William Gothman, Brian Benton, Joan Churchill, Mike Bender, Rick Weinberg, Billy Crafton, Gary Matushak, Greg Latois Lopez, James Sloan, Jonathan Dillard, John Funk, Tom Bilch, Ronald Piroli, Dave Roll, Brian Hafner, Misha LeBlanc, Ari Messinger, David Grotke, Wally Estrella, Sue Reinert, John Lecko, Stephen Granada, Philip Mueller, Robert Lackey, Dominic Carroll, Jackie McCulloch, John Hickman, Jack Smith, Carl Presso, David Neves, Patty Louise, Terry Fitzgerald, Peter Steinmetz, Timothy Fitzpatrick, Dave Fletcher, James Stratakis, David Neves, Mike Lazuski, Hank O'Donnell, David Zanoni, David Weil, Matthew Sponseller, and Scott Angelo, and new to the Society, Chad Reno, and thanks to all past and anonymous folks for helping make the show happen. Thank you for joining. You can find Pedal Shift at pedalshift.net for more great bicycle touring content. You can hear the Pedal Shift Project through Apple Podcasts or your favorite podcast app. Opening music courtesy of Jason Kent off his self-titled album. The track is called America. Check out his band Sunfield's latest release, Mono Mono, wherever cool music is available.